Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Coffee and Compatibility. The views and opinions expressed on Coffee and Compatibility are those of the podcast host and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Ashi. Welcome to another episode of Coffee and Compatibility. With me is the two most fabulous co-hosts of all time, Dr. Kelly Hitchman and Mr. Jeremy Sherrill. How are you guys? Good. Thank you so much. Hey, Eric. Couldn't be better. All right. Cool. Can you guys believe how close we are to the annual meeting? So close. Our next episode will be live. And no man, joke. I hope, I hope all of our listeners will be there um, with us. Yeah, it is kind of fun to do it live. And they give us a microphone. I still can't believe after all this time, they still give me a microphone to talk with no yeah, filter. That's probably a mistake. It, <laughs> it You know, it, there's might, a lot of questionable decisions there. We might need to change that this year. But for <laughs> those of you... second delay. For those of you who will be at the meeting, uh, the live episode is going to be Friday morning. That's October the 25th at uh, uh, 8 o'clock. Uh, the room will be announced uh, shortly, but uh, if you're at the meeting, you won't have any trouble uh, finding it uh, once you're there. So 8 a.m. Friday morning. Uh, make sure that you don't leave early. You want to stick around for Friday uh, for that live meeting and for the sessions that come after it. So Friday is a great talk day. about? We've got, we've got some very, we've got a very spicy, um, we're going to go spicy topics. Um, we're going to go spicy topics. We've got some heavy hitters um, for live expert guests, uh, which, you know, um, one of them might be from Duke. One of them might be um, uh, from the University of uh, Illinois. Ooh. Uh, <laughs> one of them might be international. Did Eric uh, just? Uh, I'm just not. I'm just not going to give a ton away. But um, there will be some controversy. We really want a topic that will get people up to those microphones and talking. And these topics will do that. That is a teaser, and I don't even know what she's talking about. Oh my! <laughs> well, that's unfortunate. <laughs> this, is, this is why we can't give Eric a mic. <laughs> Can we make a note? All right. Somebody, somebody tell Eric what the topic for the live episode that we're going to be having in a, in a month or so is going to be. Um, but one thing that Eric does know is uh, we've got some uh, good news for fans of the podcast uh, who want some merch. You want to you put that out there? Oh, yeah. So uh, the collective decided that our wonderful listeners of this podcast uh, can look in the description of the show and receive a 10% discount on your purchases at the Ashi store. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, are we going to, are we going to tell them what the code is or are we going to leave that for later? I say we leave it for later. Okay. We're going to leave it for later. You're going to have to look out for updates. You're going to have to look out for updates. Um, and I, uh, I owe so much to our executive producer, um, who is telling me, don't forget to mention the fun we're going to have at the annual meeting. That's not just the live episode. And that is fair. That is fair. Um, I would be wrong to not mention uh, that we've got some extra fun planned uh, for the annual meeting. We're going to be hosting alongside the lovely uh, Carrie Killian daily Kahoot games. If you have never played a Kahoot game, and gosh, I hope I'm saying that right. There's a lot of vowels in there. Kahoot um, it is very fun. It is very engaging. It involves making fun little avatars of yourself and uh, engaging in some trivia. It's going to be a great time. Um, so join the three of us and Carrie Killian for daily Kahoot games. You will you will love these challenges. You will love them. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Here, maybe prizes. What is that? Is that most like Jeopardy? Like Jeopardy meets The Price is Right meets Whose Line Is It Anyway? Ooh, ooh, fair That's description. good reference. Good reference. Fair description. Yes. If only we could get 
if only we could get the people from Who's Line to the Ashi meeting, that would be fantastic. That would be, I would give up my spot as a host for the Kahoot game if Drew Carey was coming. I, I would say. not. <laughs> Eric's not giving up his mic. He wants to exactly that. Eric feels about that like I feel about Star Wars. Um, but but in all seriousness, there there is lots of important business out there. They that we clearly should not be the ones to to deliver this. Um, but but in in the interest of helping the membership, uh, I do have to remind you, want want that renewal of your Ashi membership for 2025 opens on September 1st. So by the time you're listening to this, that will be open. Uh, so don't forget to renew your Ashi membership so that you can continue uh, to enjoy all the wonderful things that come with membership, um, your access to all of Ashi's educational materials, discounts, uh, and just access to a community like none other in histocompatibility and immunogenetics, the global experts in histocompatibility and immunogenetics. Don't forget to renew. Right, and on to today's topic. Uh, we have uh, a terrific guest with us here today. Dr. Ryan Pena is here to talk to us about HLA testing for transfusion support. Uh, so we will see you right back here in, after a short break to talk to Dr. Ryan Pena. Hey, coffee and compatibility fans. As a token of our appreciation, we're giving you 10% off your entire purchase at the Ashi store from now until December 31st, 2024. Just use the code WITTY BANTER. That's all caps, no spaces. W I T T Y B A N T E R at the checkout and get your hands on some fantastic Ashi gear. Thank you for all your support and loyalty. Head to the Ashi store today and enjoy your discount. Offer ends December 31st, so don't wait. Hey, everybody. Welcome to today's episode of Coffee and Compatibility. We are thrilled at CNC to have with us Dr. Ryan Pena. Um, Dr. Pena is the interim chair and pathologist in chief at Tufts Medical Center and serves as the vice chair and chief of clinical pathology. He's also the medical director of the HLA laboratory, where he focuses on histocompatibility and immunogenetics, our favorite topics. In addition to his leadership roles, Dr. Pena is a faculty member at Tufts University School of Medicine and a fellow of the American College of Histocompatibility and Immunogenetics. And he is also uh, the current co-chair of our abstract committee and on our uh, portfolio committee. So very, very involved in ASHI uh, as well. Welcome, Dr. Pena. Um, if we could, can we call you Ryan? You absolutely should, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. We are really thrilled to have you today. Um, not too long ago, what was it? Several months ago, um, there was a webinar talking about epilet and epitope uh, analysis related to a topic that I feel like we don't talk about very much, but we should, transfusion support, HLA testing for transfusion support. And so we have invited uh, Ryan on today because Ryan is an expert in transfusion support, um, in pathology, as well as in HLA practice. Um, so he's he's a, he's not just a double threat. That makes him sound like a double threat, but he's probably like a triple or a quad threat. Um, so or a non-threat. Or <laughs> only in the best ways possible. Um, so we wanted to have you on to talk about this thing that I feel like we don't talk about very much. It takes some really, um, special practice and exposure, uh, to get credentialed for transfusion support, uh, testing in the Ashi perspective. And it's just something we don't talk about very much. Um, so Ryan, could you just kind of start off by telling us like, how did you get into transfusion medicine and how did that flow for you into a career that involved histocompatibility and immunogenetics in the first place? Yeah, well, thank you, Kelly. And again, thanks, Eric and Jeremy for inviting me. Um, it's an honor to be here. So it, it's actually interesting, you know, of all the things I've done in my scientific and medical career, HLA and transfusion, I actually fell into by mistake. It was all by chance. So I was doing um, pathology um, residency 
And during those rotations, I actually ran into this lab called the HLay Lab. And they had this Luminex instrument, which I had used for my PhD. And then they were talking about some immunogenetics and I had done some mouse MHC, you know, um, STR type of testing. And I said, what is this? And so I didn't really know what that was. Um, I was initially going to go into hematology and, and fell into pathology. And so within the realm of pathology, I really wanted to do something around immunology and hematology. And so transfusion was something I didn't even know existed. So I also fell into that, into that during my rotations. Um, and what was interesting was I found that the things that I was most interested in, in terms of the basic science, um, you know, my PhD was in immunology um, and, and, and microbiology. And it was very interesting because there were many, many laboratory tests that I knew the basic science of, but I didn't really know the interpretation and how that applied to clinical medicine. And it sounded like as I went through these rotations, these were the two things that drew me in. The, the most fascinating thing is as I got to know more of HLA and transfusion, there are actually very similar parallels um, to, to those two fields. You know, we've got the antigen antibody interactions, we've got genetics that that inform us on the immune response as well as the antigen um, phenotype. So everything that I've learned in transfusion and HLA is, you know, in my mind is actually very similar. We just call them different things, HLA, red cell antigen. So that's how I got into it. You know, Ryan, thank you so much for that. Now, I think it's funny how many times someone in our shoes like falls into like an HLA lab, if you will. Same thing has happened across number of guests that we've had the, the privilege to talk to here. Um, I want to get your thoughts on why do we care so much about transfusion support in our labs? Can you can you help me with that? Yeah. So so just I think from a basic perspective, right? The HLA lab, I, I think realistically, our society and, and the folks in histocompatibility have really focused on transplantation, the solid organ and bone marrow stuff. And similarly, the folks in transfusion medicine have focused on red cell transfusion and plasma. The reality is, I think there, there, you know, for a long time, at least when I first started, maybe 10, 15 years ago, there was a gap in which the HLA folks only focused on their lane and the transfusion folks focused on their lane. And I think we, um, as a group, the, the, there was a clear understanding that the transfusion folks did not know enough about HLA testing, which was critical, right? The vast majority of transfusion support, the way we think about it, really requires a clear understanding of HLA testing and interpretation and what that means. And unfortunately, I think even in general pathology, there's not a lot of folks that have vast exposure. For, for pathologists that um, do any electives, it's maybe two weeks to a month. Um, and that's reflected in every single HLA uh, DIT or director and training candidate that we've had is it's it's minimum. So I think there was an important need. And so, you know, I think there's also this issue that platelet refractors in particular here and, and donor selection for platelets it is an underappreciated clinical need. There's a lot of them, but people don't understand what it is and they don't know what to do with it. So I think there is a there's a niche in which HLA directors and HLA supervisors are able to um I, I think contribute to the care of patients who have this problem. So Ryan, uh, you mentioned sort of uh, there's there's a group of people who who seem to focus a lot on transplant and and sometimes maybe they don't they don't cross over too much and and do a whole lot of transfusion support. So for for those people, especially the technologists who are working uh, to support transplants day to day. What are the differences in HLA testing for transfusion support as opposed to transplant? Ah, that's actually fascinating, Jeremy. So actually, there is no difference. The same understanding we apply for antibody testing and HLA typing is the same thing we would do. So when you think about that, it's really the issue of you've got a recipient who has antibodies, right? And in organ transplantation or even bone marrow transplantation, you know, the presence of HLA antibodies are associated with the destruction or, or, you know, some adverse event anyways, adverse outcome with the allograft. So when you think about what a platelet is, it's essentially a liquid transplant, right? They were giving cells from a donor. And if you have antibodies against it, you might destroy um, the platelets. So the way we in the HLA lab, and especially technologists would interpret it is the same thing. 
is the antibody present? And if it is, we want to know what it is. And if it's there, how strong is it? And do we think it's pathologic, right? That's that's really the critical thing. So when we look at it from that perspective, it becomes very easy to understand from the recipient standpoint. Now, from the donor standpoint, think of it as somebody who um, is looking for a living donor um, selection, right? You've got perhaps, um, I, I've got four, uh, there's four of us, I've got three siblings, and let's say I need a, a kidney, I'd have to select and pick the best one. So one of the things we would have to do is HLA type those donors to see if I have antibody against them and pick the one that doesn't have antibody, right? Um, so that's the basic crux is when you think about the technical work that we do for HLA um, in terms of solid organ bone marrow, it's actually extendable to platelet transfusion support as well as other things. Um, so I, I really see it as a natural extension of the HLA lab to be able to do this type of thing. And again, remember that when we think about the donor selection from a bone marrow stand, standpoint, we always assume that the best donor is the highest, you know, the best HLA match to somebody and then their secondary, you know, lower, you know, importance um, selection criteria such as age, you know, sex and stuff like that. It, same thing with, with donors is if you've got a lot of donors, supposing you do, um, you know, you select based on the HLA match or the presence or absence of, of anti, uh, cognate antigen that the antibody can attack. So it's very similar. Um, I, I, I see it that way. Um, I think what's, what's different, however, is because many HLA labs do not have any insight or access to the donor pool. You know, for most hospitals, so the source of our platelets are really two, two locations, one of which is the hospital itself has a donor center and they collect all of those things. And then for the vast majority of hospitals, we actually rely on blood centers like the Red Cross or America's Blood Centers. So all of those are, are people that I think when I think about how HLA technologists and supervisors could access, it does help to be able to communicate just like we, our technologists communicate with transplant coordinators, for instance, to figure out, you know, the donors. Those are, I think that's maybe one of the missing gaps is we don't know where those donors are coming from. And I think if we could access that and and give our, our folks a little bit more insight into that, I think that would, it would click in an instant because it's the same approach, I think, when we think about it. You've taken this to a great area. So I think um, I think that is a really important idea. Like both sides actually don't really fully understand what each other are doing. These these centers that are providing the units um, are often, I hope, um, looking at the HLA data that we are making and using it to determine or to recommend what platelets should maybe be applied but they're using different terminology than what HLA labs do, which is just um, from my perspective as somebody who sees this a lot kind of maddening. Um, and one thing that we do that um, they don't understand as much as we don't really understand why they use the bars they use to select the units, um, they don't understand how we're determining what antibodies might be relevant and what antibodies might not be relevant. And thank goodness for all of us, you have a fantastic paper out in the literature where you actually studied from an MFI perspective. And oh my gosh, those three letters make my ears burn, but we're just going to use them because we have to. Um, you actually did a study where you determined what level of MFI detection you thought determined what was safe and permissible to cross and what wasn't with regards to um, platelet infusion or platelet matching. So tell us a little bit about that paper because I think it's actually probably the outcome is maybe surprising to some people. Maybe some people think, okay, if our bar for what's dangerous for a solid organ is here, then our bar for like a cell on cell fight should be like way lower, yeah. but that's not the case. No, tell us, tell no. us about it. It's a yeah. great paper. So it, it, you know, so this research paper I did at my prior institution, and I worked there for ten years, and I had a couple of transfusion fellows who were also interested in HLA. Actually, one of whom went on to become an HLA director as well. What's interesting is that I think just going back to the parallels of all um, transplant and transfusion support, right, is normally when we're being asked, we try and pick the most compatible or least immunologic, you know, barrier towards transplantation. 
And, and so in general, the, the first thing we recommend, at least from the AABB technical manual, is what we, Rob Luski and I have authored that, uh, that chapter for the last two editions, is, you know, you want to give somebody who's absolutely not going to cause a problem, right? And so what that really means is, for us as well, is don't give, don't select a donor in which there's a cognate antigen and the antibodies there. The reality is, we, we don't see that all the time. In highly sensitized patients who have CPRAs of you know, 80 to 100%, we, we run into the same thing is that there's not as many donors as you think that are compatible on the, on the basis of either HLA matching alone or on the basis of lacking that antigen, right? So sometimes we have to pick one. And one of the differences I think that I think people worry about in transfusion medicine is that when this happens to a patient, they're actively bleeding or there's there's an issue right now. Whereas in transplant, you know, especially in living donor, you've got a couple of weeks to figure it out. Um, and in deceased donor, you know, we think about certain things like uh, if they're not highly sensitized, what's the likelihood of them getting another offer, correct? So, but in transfusion, it's slightly different because the decision-making has to be then and there, depending on how rapidly they're bleeding and whether or not their platelet count is low. Now, if they're stable, they're just, you know, their platelet counts, they're on chemotherapy or, you know, and they need transfusion support once a week, then it's not a big deal. But if they're in the OR actively bleeding and they're, you know, they're, they're a, a heart transplant, for instance, or a liver transplant, and, and we're seeing this, that's when the selection becomes a problem. So what we found is, you know, without, with th there was a lot of anecdotal evidence that the same reason where in organ transplant, if you gave, um, if you crossed a low level antibody, there's probably not as much, you know, problem as you might think. And remember that to your point, Kelly, the MFI is such a weird number. It's not standardized. Um, you know, it means nothing, you know, somebody's 1000 might be somebody's 3000, but the reality is we needed to start somewhere and say, for those, we don't have an HLA match or a negative, uh, don't, you know, an, an HLA negative, um, donor, we have to cross that that immunologic barrier. And so in, in the heat of the moment, sometimes you have to have some guidelines. That's how medicine works, right? We all kind of want to know what the gold standard is or what most of us would do, because the last thing we would want is suggest something that's not evidence-based. So that was the premise of that paper is we look back at 10 years of how we did this. And what we found was, you know, a vast majority of patients, we couldn't actually find HLA matched or antigen negative units. So we had to cross a barrier. And what we found was we just looked at those that we crossed the barrier. And a lot of that was gestalt. You know, I had trained our colleagues to say, well, what's low level? Well, MFI 3000, 4000 is low level. So we'll accept that. So what we would tell our blood donor centers was stuff like, listen, um, Red Cross, help us out. But this is how we would select our donors is we give you the histogram and we list down the antibodies and say, these are the ones we should never cross. These, if you can't find anything that's HLA match, we might cross those, but talk to us first. It's the same conversation we have, right? With our coordinators and, and transplant colleagues. So that's kind of like our, our approach to that one. And so we were able to get all this data retrospectively and look at whether they responded or did not. And surprisingly, you know, at a, at a mo what we would call, you know, low to moderate le level, which is in our minds, you know, the 5,000, 6,000, they actually had a response that was pretty good that saved their lives or stopped the bleeding. So we got to where we needed to be, you know, so that's really the number. And, and I've been asked many times, so 6,000, you know, what, what we should use. And I said, well, you know, the caveat in the paper is, you know, I think everybody should try it and then they'll see. Um, not everybody has the opportunity to kind of do the study we can. And I think so what I, I, what I would say to other centers is if they wanted to try the 6,000, they could try it. Um, but then, you know, if they're not seeing a good response that maybe cut it a little bit lower, maybe their MFIs are running, you know, a little lower than ours, our 6,000 is their 4,000. Um, but for us, you know, I've, I've moved to a different institution and my selection criteria is still 6,000 and it still works. Um, you know, so, so within the Boston area, I've been to two hospitals and I know one of our colleagues at a different hospital. So these three hospitals have used that and, and the 6,000 in general works, I think as a, if you're unsure, that's a good, safe number to to start off with. Yeah. You know, Ryan, I think you just did such an excellent job of highlighting so many different ways uh, to approach a very complex problem. And I want to emphasize, provide excellent clinical consultation to our partners 
across the medical field, right? And not only what we should be trying to approach these things and sort of remain remembering what the ultimate goal is, right? And not being so stuck on a, a, a MFI number. I'm going to whisper it. So it's like, you know, it's like Beetlejuice. If you say it too often, things start happening. So um, thank you for that. I want to, in our last few minutes, Ryan, I wanted to see, get your thoughts on where's the future for transfusion support antibody analysis in this in this area where do you see us going in in the yeah. evolution of this it, it, it's interesting you asked that i think that is such a broad question i think the answers are as varied as transplant right obviously the first answer is well guess what let's increase the donor pool right well you know what in tra in transfusion there's several million tens of millions of donors the problem is that the platelets only last for five days, really. So once we we um, have a great, you know, altruistic person who just wants to save a life, they give the platelet, it lasts five, you know, five days or so. Um, and so even though there's a lot more, they don't last as long. And, you know, our HLA variety, perhaps the 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 genetic um, variability and polymorphism in there. We, we don't have a diverse enough pool depending on the location that you're in. So th there's that, right? And then there's also the issue of, hey, how do we um, control the antibody response, right? Because a lot of us think about desensitization. And actually at the current institution I, I'm in, they uh, we did a little uh, clinical trial. One of my uh, fellows who became an attending here um, actually did a trial with IDs, right? The, the FC receptor cleavage and, you know, it works just like in transplant. Guess what? It cleaves all these HLA antibodies, surprising, unsurprisingly rather. Um, so I think there's a lot of parallels that we can do to do that. Um, I think the one thing I will make a comment on, and this might be a little controversial. There are folks that believe that, you know, the Eplet matchmaker and, and to Kelly's point, she started with, with um, a webinar around this, is I think as laboratorians, we are all under pressure with um, financial pressures to make sure we do the testing and approach correctly. The problem with applet analysis and any of those epitope analysis is almost always we need to do high resolution typing of these millions of donors. So the same reason people have argued against double typing our deceased donors, you know, we as laboratory directors and folks in the lab are responsible for also propping up the healthcare system and not making it too difficult. Today, though, I will say, you know, in 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 areas that um, that have high highly sensitized patients, meaning those that have bone marrow transplant, and you know, unfortunately, there are still some folks that have HLA antibodies because they they were exposed to blood that was not leuk reduced years ago. So, in those centers that have that, really realistically, I think the approach in which you do the HLA typing rapidly um, is is one way to do it because I think we need to to make a decision that. In transfusion support, time is of the essence, right? And I think that's what we need to clarify first is, do we need to have an ability to HLA type and do antibody testing as if they were a deceased don donor organ and have access to that? Because I think with the donor pool, there is enough in there, but we have had to have typed them and, and the Red Cross does a good job. My understanding is the Red Cross, for instance, the moment you've been a multi time donor, they actually HLA type you so they have your HLA type and we can select donors against specific antibody profiles. Um, so I think there's there's a lot of, I guess, I guess the bottom, the, the short answer is we need structurally to make things accessible to people because the tools to ha we have today in, in transfusion to me are sufficient. Um, you know, platelets, unlike organs, only last a long time, uh, a short amount of time. They're not good sensitizers, by the way. Unlike when you think about organ transplant, the reason you only want one transplant per lifetime is everything fails over time. You get sensitized to them. Platelets are not actually a strong sensitizer. That's been shown many, many decades ago. So repeat antibody um, platelet transfusions, as long as they're leuk reduced, don't really elicit a long lasting antibody. Um, most of those actually we see were sensitized from either children or prior transfusions from non leukemia reduced blood. So there's that too, is I think there's a lot of combinations, but I think to me, structurally, we need to make sure that we um, as a society work with the blood centers to make sure that it's eat, that, that, that interaction happens more rapidly so that even small hospitals or, you know, faraway hospitals that don't have blood centers readily available, there's a communication we can do so 
the director supervisors can communicate with the blood centers and say, hey, what do you have in there? And can we talk about which donors you could give us or you could call in, for instance. We've done that too for highly sensitized. Um, we've, we've, and, and you know, we've done things like calling the Red Cross in the West Coast or in the South uh, because the only donors they had in their in their list was was from that region. Um, so I think that's really where we need to make a, a, a run for. Yeah, that is such a great point. I, I think we're all trying to accomplish the same goal, right? So I think when there's more understanding from each side about what each side is contributing towards that same goal, yeah. we come a long, long way. Ryan, thank you so much for being with us today. This was a fascinating discussion. I can't wait for the listeners um, to get a chance to hear it and to to get some feedback from this episode. Really enjoyable. And thanks uh, for, for taking it there and going controversial, um, but kind of keeping our feet on the ground too. Appreciate it so much. Thanks again. Thanks, thanks Kelly. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, 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 Bye. Thank you, Ryan. Hi there, listeners. Do you want to shine a spotlight on a technologist that you know? Nominate someone for Tech Talk and share their story by emailing us at info at hla.org for a feature opportunity on an upcoming episode of Coffee and Compatibility. Welcome back. It is time for The Tea, a segment dedicated to answering your questions from our listeners. This question comes to us from an anonymous, mysterious listener who wants to know... What about antibody testing frequency? My lab tests antibody updates every six months. And I wonder, is this appropriate or should we be testing more frequently? How is that determined? Dear listener, this is a fantastic question and I wish there were an easy answer, but there's not an easy answer. Uh, of the labs that I've worked at, each one I've worked at has a different antibody testing frequency scheme. Uh, we um, dictate this based on our patient population and the average instance of sensitizing event contact. Uh, and we live in an area where um, most of our patients um, are Hispanic and they have um, frequent sensitizing events. And so we were testing quarterly. Um, we're actually going to increase the frequency of our testing by the end of this year because we intend to start doing more virtual cross-matching exclusively and slightly less flow cytometric cross-matching. Um, so we've decided that if we're going to put more weight on virtual cross-matching, we want to test more frequently. Um, what, what about you, Eric? Yeah, I mean, I think this is like, this question must come up all the time, right? Like, I feel like we here at UNC Chapel Hill must have like, discussed it just, you know, a few days ago. And so we follow an algorithm that is sort of how likely is an individual to receive an offer. And if they are likely to receive an offer, then we test them more frequently. They're less likely than they follow uh, a sort of different pattern. And that's actually worked out really well for us, but we have sort of a, like, we'll say more traditional patient population compared to like, say your population, Kelly. Um, and so that's really worked out for us, but you're absolutely right. Like I honestly, I think a few days ago, we just talked about if we needed to do more single engine bead uh, based testing to facilitate exactly what, what you are. And to me, that's probably where the question really lies. What do you think, Jeremy? Yeah, I, I, I think you both hit it on the head, which is that there, there's no perfect answer. Um, we do quarterly uh, for for our patients primarily. Um, but, I, I, you know, I, I think Kelly hit on sensit sensitization events. And a, a lot of it is we, you need to be in touch with your transplant center, uh, with, with the clinicians. You need to be in good communication when you know there are sensitizing events. Uh, and, and, and so there, there's not going to be a cookie cutter sort of sort of scheme uh, that's going to work for every single patient. So I, I think it's always best to be conservative, especially right right at the beginning when you're first uh, listing a patient, um, you know, and to, to really get a good picture early on. Uh, but then uh, is, it, is it necessary to, to, to treat every patient the same? Probably not, depending on uh, what the circumstance is. 
Yeah. So dear listener, there are some themes there. Um, while we don't have a unified answer for that specific frequency, the unified themes that you're hearing are, you know, how sensitized is your patient to begin with? That could be important in determining how often their antibodies might fluctuate. And based on your patients or your group of patients' backgrounds, do they have an increased risk of inflammation? Do they have an increased risk that they might more frequently incur sensitizing events? Um, all of those things should lead you uh, to an answer that's right for your laboratory and your patient population. Uh, so this is a great question today. Thank you so much. If you need career advice or advice on how to deal with something happening in your lab, visit our podcast page at ashi-hla.org backslash ashi podcast or email us at info at ashi-hla.org and write the T. TEA in the subject line. So guys, I am just buzzing because like these episodes go by so fast. I and know. Ryan was such a great guest. There were so many things that I wanted to ask that I didn't get to that he, you know, uh, his conversation brings back to me. Like, what about all this FDA stuff? Like um, HLA is going to remain under discretion except for hematopoietic stem cell or, uh, or transfusion support where there are already regulations and HLA is so standardized you know, the only um, reagents FDA approved for that purpose are SSO for that mm -hmm. typing, when we could be doing sequencing faster and cheaper. Like what's going to happen with that? Um, what's going to happen with this terminology that these blood banks and these donor centers use that we don't use these, these match systems, B1, B2, looking yeah, yeah. at just old school, low res ser ser serology instead of the typing that we actually have, or even just typing to the same resolution. Like, oh, oh yeah. Um, yeah, this, this hits home for me. I'm, um, I'm, uh, certified for transfusion support. And this is what he's talking about is exactly how we structure our reports to give the donor centers as much information as possible. Best case scenario, it's a two field HLA match. Um, not as great a scenario, uh, you could cross these. There are no antibodies to these. Most dicey case scenario, here are these weak antibodies that you know could be permissible to cross. Um, and we're using thresholds based on his publication. That's one of the very few publications out yeah. there that says like, this is a level that we've found is safe to cross in transfusion support. And that's really what we need though, right? Is like, we need some sort of like data-driven guidance, right? Like so many of us have been, I don't wanna say over-focused, but focused solely on like the transplant side of what our labs and community have done, right? And we've talked at nauseum about MFIs and the inherent issues there, hence why it's the Beetlejuice version. Um, but we got to pay the same attention to the transfusion support, right? And if we want to move forward, we as a community need to sort of plant our flag, right? And say, this testing needs to be in our labs. This testing needs to have this appropriate level of technology being done. And that may or may not include high resolution HLA typing. Yeah. And like, like Jeremy said, we're, you know, we could be confusing the heck out of our text too, because yeah. we don't talk about this very much, you know, are we leading to misconceptions in, in our technologists that this is inherently so, so different than solid organ transplantation, or maybe the opposite that we're not highlighting, you know, what the differences are and from both sides, because there are technologists learning these things from the blood bank yep. and from the donor side. And then there are technologists in the HLA labs learning a very different approach, a very different purview and very different nomenclature. Yeah, it was a great interview for me because never having worked in a lab that supported a transfusion program before, you know, there was just a lot to pick up from uh, how differently or, or how similarly you do some things and then 
uh, uh, at the same time, how you may gauge strength, antibody strength a little bit differently, um, what the, the uh, long lasting antibody response might be, uh, what the long lasting sensitization effects might be. Uh, what I'm most glad about just though, is that, is that Kelly survived the interview when, when, when MFI came up, Kelly, your face, uh, oh. uh, I, I, if it seemed like nails on a chalkboard here, I thought, I thought you might not make it. Yeah. I mean, we all struggle, right? Like that's the, it's the, uh, it's uh, a necessary evil. Yeah. I mean, when it comes to the literature, you've got to, you've got to use something as a, a calculation, a statistical bar. When it comes to clinical practice, we know there are so many inherent flaws with assumptions about the meaning or lack thereof of that number. But see, but Ryan did a fabulous job of explaining something that was, that is incredibly complex um, and into those like myself who don't sort of live in the transfusion world, right? And, and you know, being able to, to understand and see where, you know, the issues lie for, you know, experts like him. I thought, you know, he was one of the better ones I think we've, we've talked to in a long time. Yeah, he's he's an outstanding dude. Um, so yeah, look for more um, from Dr. Pena. And if you haven't sought out his publications, yeah, your correct. laboratory performs testing for transfusion support. I highly recommend um, that you look at his publications, Dr. Lewski's publications. Um, it's really good stuff. Awesome. Thanks, guys. He's got great hair too. We got to acknowledge that he's got time. great hair. Best. Bye. <laughs>